the Gen Zs in Kenya have terrorized the country. I'm using the word terrorized because that is what the government operatives have decided to say because they're going ahead to try to expose them and trying to, uh, you know, curtail them down. However, the young people of Kenya are standing firm and what many people are defining as they're trying, they've understood what it means or their role in governance and democracy and they're still standing firm and tall. So joining me to discuss this very interesting topic, which is the battle of Kenyan government operatives to expose Gen Z backers. What value will it uh, add? Uh, to discuss this very interesting conversation is a panel of distinguished ladies and gentlemen who will help me un unpack uh, this conversation and put perspective to it. Uh, the panel has gentlemen and ladies who are interested in issues of African, of, 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 of of Africa, but also are very are very informed in issues to do with what's happening in Kenya. So I'll just start from my immediate right to my extreme right. We must quickly make an introduction, then we get into the discussion. Gentlemen, you're most welcome. Thank you so much, our dear moderator, for welcoming me and for having me oftentimes to, to discuss such matters. Our dear viewers, the crew and my fellow panelists, good afternoon. My name is Kwesiga Emmanuel and I am a Yath Lilo student transiting to year four now, UCU, uh, Mukono campus. Most importantly, as part of my introduction, is that I am an affiliate, or I am a member of Africa Kwetu, and that is a body that has the intentions of, of, of having a united, uh, united Africa. I am also a writer with one published book, The Magic of Successful Living, and my second book to be released on 1st August, titled All Has Changed, subtitled Uganda Through the Decades, a very interesting piece. That is basically it. I'm looking forward to reading Uganda Through yes, the Decades. You like it, and of course it very much relates to our topic this very evening. Yeah, this definitely. Very oh, thank you. That's, 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 that's quite interesting for a young man such as yourself to do the works that you do and write literature of very great uh, insight, but also great contribution to the nation to the nation is something that is worth celebrating. And thank you very much for what you're doing there. Thank uh, you. The only lady on the show, most welcome. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, the moderator and the fellow panelists. Um, my name is Melody, Melody Nakalanzi. I'm a student at Makere University, transiting to my year four, doing a bachelor's of social work. I do not have a big CV like Emma's, mm -hmm. but um, <laughs> I am a student that yeah. is trying to make sure that voices of young people are heard. I am <coughs> with different organizations that mainly do advocacy. I work with, I volunteer with a female organization called MEMPRO. And currently I am interning at an HIV organization where I feel like it all comes back to issues of young people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Definitely, that's a very, it's a still a heavy CV. <laughs> I also believe what she referred to as a small one. Yeah, because that is still quite a CV. Uh, it's, it's, very, it's, 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 it's very heartwarming to see young people uh, pick up passions, but also pick up social justice issues that are crucial and they take it on and ride it on. So I think it's a matter of time as well we picked interest in issues of politics and advocate for it. So that's why we're having this conversation. But thanks. Uh, the Pan-Africans. <laughs> Thank you very much, Drake. Uh, to, to our dear viewers, a, a very good afternoon, and to my fellow panelists. My name is George Guinera Oroch. I'm a third year law student, like Wesiga. I'm also transitioning into year four. Uh, yeah, I think I'll stop it at that. I won't, I'm, I'm not very... Uh, the ZB is not as heavy as my colleagues here. Yeah. Possibly yeah. many other things will be said as the show continues. All right, thank you. <coughs> that's, that's quite interesting. So let me just start the show with Emma. Mm. Um, on the 9th of May, um, the, in, in, the Kenyan, in, the Kenyan, in the Kenyan National Assembly, what here we call as the parliament, they tabled the, the financial bill, which is the one of 2024. Yeah. You know, the financial bill is something that you, uh, you go ahead and review it on a yearly basis, considering the context of the finances that happen in, in, in the country, but also the activities that go on. So from that background, you understand that after the reading of that bill, you saw uh, Baba Railo Dinga commenting two weeks later and saying that that particular bill is a clamp down on investment in Kenya and it's going to see more people riding into the ambience of poverty. And from that, you see what happened. People, young people, went on the streets. People rallied themselves. 
took it to the streets and said, Ruto must go, financial bill must be scrapped off, etc. And the fight still persists up to today. Mm. But now the question that we're trying to discuss is the government in, the government in, in Kenya is trying to expose uh, the, the, what they, they, to expose the backers of Gen Zs. Just give us context to this. Do we have people backing this? Or it's young people who are trying to push the conversation and trying to reclaim their civic duty? Well, thank you so much for, for your question. And of course, I must start by acknowledging to, to you, our viewers, and to the rest of you with me here, that this is a very pertinent issue. Otherwise, a, a, another person would look at this and they wonder why of all things affecting Uganda, we, we choose to go abroad and tackle an issue that concerns our neighbors. Yeah. But the Uganda have a proverb that Omri translating to mean that uh, whatever affects your neighbor equally affects you because change is, is really so sudden and it is persistent that what happens to her, be it a disease, yeah. it could be a contagious one and the next day I am, I am a victim because we, we are neighbors. So yeah. indeed we are not discussing an issue that is far-fetched but we are discussing a rather so pertinent and immediate yeah. issue because these are our neighbors and what of course happens to them equally affects us. So it, it, is, it indeed deserves uh, attention and discuss. So going straight to, to your question, I hold an opinion. My opinion might be informed by a number of factors. Mm. But of course, I do not want to think that it is conclusive, neither do I want to think that it is accurate. Yeah. Because my feedback might be different from, from theirs. But what I really think, I put on my status yesterday, if you did see that, I said that uh, society is one compri comprised of injustices, especially in our African societies today. Yeah. Being more specific in our East African countries, democracy is largely an illusion and a picture that we, we create and not a living thing, mm -hmm. in my own opinion. But also, we need to understand that even when that is the case, even when we have suppressive governments yeah. and dictatorial regimes. Of course, some people do not want to hear this, but when we come here, we do not come to massage any, 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 any scars, but we come to, to, to speak truth to, to power, power. And, to, and facts. So what happens is that people have been suppressed for quite often. Mm. But also, it is important for us to understand that lots of things affect people. However, the hierarchy really differs. That it could be a thing affect us, affecting us from the sphere of education. That can wait. We might not be radical about it. Mm. We might not write our stand to, to do something about it. But I think concerning my, my survival, food, and where I am going to live, and anything concerning the medical aspect, mm. that is part of, of your livelihood. You can survive without education. You might not go to school and you can still live, but without health care, without food, you can't survive. So that is why the financial bill has had uh, such ramifications mm. for Kenya because it has a direct impact and bearing on, on the livelihood of these people. Yeah. Because finances, of course, finances go to, to how you survive, how you live, how you access medication. So, in my own opinion and response to your question, I think it goes to a point where these people, of course, given the, the circumstances of, mm. of their nation and looking at their their budgets yeah. and their income status, of realizing that should, uh, of course I believe that they read it and internalized it and knew the components of that same bill. So I think when they looked at it, they realized that should it come into play, mm. then the, their survival is likely going to be, to be so hard and the costs of living really being so high, mm. high, high for them. So what option did they have? Diplomacy does not seem to to work quite often here in Africa, even mm. when it is a better alternative. You mm. and I will agree that that would have been better because it is cheap, yes, because it, is, it doesn't take so much time and it mm. does not go with the destruction of property or even loss of lives. But it doesn't work most times, at least for, for our governments. So what do these people have to do? They had to compel their government mm. to do away with the bill. What mechanism did they have a turn that can be applicable and possible and feasible? Mm. It is in the demonstrations that we also. Then the, the question of 
who finances it, I cannot pretend to, to know so much. But at least what I know and what I've seen from the information I've seen online, from these engagements I've seen, these people running the demonstrations, I think that people, the ordinary person, who is a direct victim of these bills, has realized that they do not have a voice going to fight for them, apart from them having a collective and united effort to do away with it and the like. So I think basically, even if we have any funders or people behind the scenes that we do not see, but I think it is basically a youth-led demonstration. For as much as I know, I've even known it, mm. that when they have another person trying to, to be part of them and this person is in a higher political position, they actually pull that person out of that race because they don't even want it to have a leadership. Yeah. Because usually what happens when a demonstration has leaders, government targets them either by, by compromising them or even any other uh, rude mechanism they could deploy. But when a thing has no uh, structure, mm. you, you definitely can find it hard to, to fight it because you will kill so and death continues. So I think it is basically their own initiative and the, in uh, arising out of need of knowing that they have a right they should defend. Okay, mm. interesting. Melody, a right they should defend. And the government of Kenya, is uh, the conversation is rising and saying, uh, could young people <coughs> be having, could, could there be some people behind the scenes financing young people to voice out their concerns and take it out to the streets? You know the avenues of amicably solving situations. You have dialogue. After dialogue, if dialogue fails, then you could possibly opt for what peaceful demonstrations. Yeah. And at times when the, the peaceful demonstrations fail, that is when you opt for extreme violence. But the situation in Kenya, uh, people argue that, you know, uh, the dialogue wasn't sufficient, or there was really no dialogue at all. So what, hop what people opted for was peaceful demonstrations. People are saying, we have, they termed the president as Batman the flying president, never in the country. Or to airline. <laughs> <laughs> and the issue they are trying to, 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 to front is something that concerns them. Yeah. But now the government is saying you have people who are backing these Gen Z's in Kenya. How true is that according to you? Okay. Thank you very much. So I, I'll definitely speak in the same line with Emma. Mm. Um, number one, what I, th I think is that we do not have people backing these people, yeah. these young people. Because just like Uganda, the biggest percentage of people in Kenya are actually youth, are actually young people, right? So, and generally like Africa, most people are actually young. Yeah. So we realize these are people that have been suffocated over time. Number one, <coughs> these people have no jobs. And then you're bringing a bill that is going to suffocate them the more. Realize that actually they say 12 but that the bill was going to increase the unemployment rate by 12% because it was going to suffocate most of the things. So if there is a generation that realizes that this is not good for us, then they have to stand up and find a way. But I'll not draw away from the fact that maybe there are people financing them or what or backing them up. Even if they were there, it would still come to the young people or to the, to the people that are, are in the demonstration themselves, like to understand, do we really have to fight for this? Or do we have um, like a chance to say, we can now do away with it? Because usually if there's an old man sponsoring you, these people do not like violence. They want us to keep quiet and follow their lead. Or if they have an MP or a minister that says, hey, this is good, this MP would... Um, not show up at the end of the day and say, I am supporting the youth that are doing a demonstration at the end of the day. Reasons that this MP would, first of all, lose his seat. Number two, um, the government would actually try to suffocate him because of reasons that he is supporting maybe what they would term as a rebel group or terrorists. So what I think is that these young people, it is actually them mm. or us that are saying, hey, this is not the right way things are supposed to be done. Because solely our people are, defend, are depending on us. If I don't have a job, <coughs> my mother is not going to eat. My, grand, my grandmother is not going to eat. So at the end of the day, it is them who have the drive to understand that these things have to be changed. If they have a president who flies in and out of the country every day, it means this person does not really understand what the country is going through. Yeah. 
but rather listens to what the country is going through, maybe through media or through people that are on ground, but how true will he think that this is at the end of the day? You need to be there to understand what is happening. Sometimes people will tell you, but that is not first-hand information. You need to witness for yourself what is happening. So for the people that have been there, have understood what the problem is, and rather say, this is not the right way. Dialogues have not worked. Things have been done. I am sure they have had representatives to talk to the government on what best can be done, mm. but maybe there has not been changed. Because by the time someone chooses extreme means, means they have really tried to be peaceful, and found a solution that that would work for them but rather has not been there so these things usually come because we have tried the best peaceful ways and they have failed so rather we go for extreme things and then have change okay george i'm going to ask you the direct question mm. the battle of kenyan government operatives to expose dnz's workers will it add value uh I, I think, Nen, if you'd permit me, I, I won't differ very much from what uh, my fellow panelists have actually shared. Yeah. Because I'm also a firm believer, because we've had this discussion actually before with, with some group of colleagues, and we're trying to find out whether these protests were actually organic, whether they came out of an issue that is very evident that we're all seeing. And I think you gave a very good chronology of events of how we are here thus far and how we are discussing this. Mm. that uh, the protests that we are seeing today, unlike maybe even protests abroad or elsewhere, sprung out of an issue, mm. an issue that was too pertinent that the Gen Zs or the young people, and actually all Kenyans, not only the Gen Zs, yeah. uh, said that no, <coughs> enough is enough. We kept quiet on your flights. We kept quiet on people plundering uh, country sources. We kept quiet on all these other things. But on this one, we are fed up. And uh, I think I'll, I'll give, uh, I'll, I'll draw back to something that I read, uh, I think a month back, uh, Martin Luther's letter from Birmingham. Uh, we all know the civil rights movement, and there were two very familiar figures in the civil rights movement. That was Malcolm X and Martin Luther. But the distinction between those two people was that they disagreed on how to approach the civil rights. Mm. Malcolm X ad advocated for a very violent uh, approach towards the, the white man, while Martin Luther said no, because he was an apostle of the church. Yeah, yeah. He said, let us sit yeah, down, yeah. let us talk to our brothers, because ultimately the, 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 these things that divide us are not thicker than the blood that unites mm. us. Mm. And Malcolm X said no. We should attack this. The person who is sending dogs to us to fight us, we should actually also uh, send an iron arm towards that person. We can't show fear while the other person is showing us aggression. But uh, at, at the tail end, before Martin Luther was, uh, was killed, he had also believed, and that, wrote, and that letter justifies why he had also taken up the violent approach. And he says one thing in the letter that is very peculiar, that there comes a time where the cup of endurance runs out. And I think that did in Kenya, where people say that you can no longer dialogue, but you have to go and express our anger on the streets. Now, the question comes in on who <coughs> is barking. And like I said before, I would also want to believe 100% that uh, these, these protests did not come out of nowhere. This is an issue-based protest, that mm -hmm. you have a finance bill in a country where the employment levels are high, very, very high, and you want to introduce taxes on basic commodities like bread, you want to introduce an annual tax on cars, you want to introduce uh, a tax on diapers and whatnot. And when people say that is not right, I think basically that that doesn't that that uh, that that means that the protests were justified. Yeah. Then, secondly, in as regards to backing, because the the protests, uh, and I think this will defy with my fellow panelists, is that we all saw on live television how these protests came about stage by stage. Because I'm also a very good fan of Citizen and Ketien, and mm -hmm. most of these things were being broadcasted live. And for protests that. Uh, evolved peacefully, for some reason, uh, they became violent. You would see footage of people burning cars, people destroying buildings, people buying buildings, people going to parliament and destroying this and this and this. So I think, uh, on my part, yeah. the government, in, in, on, in my opinion, is then justified to sort of find out for the protests that started a little peaceful, why then should they take the violent downturn that we're seeing evolve in the country? And I think, 
if we are all Kenyans, the same way Kwesiga uh, enjoys the right to protest, I also enjoy the right to access medical care during those protests, mm. to also move from Mombasa to Kisumu safely. Yeah. And I think that's a justifiable claim by government. To also give context, uh, the Kenyan president, uh, Raisi Ruto, won a very, a high, a very dis di divisive election. Raila and Ruto all got 7 million, uh, just, I think, a difference of hundreds and thousands. So I think in, in that sort of context, in that society, surely, there's always going to be that pushback to, 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 to the, the, the people will not be overly supportive of the government. Mm -hmm. I, I would want to presume that there's always this part that is saying, no, we deserved better, we deserved Baba, who is Raila. And uh, it goes without saying that <coughs> some of these things, these peaceful protests across the, across the globe, some of these things have actually been, the, the, as long as they pick up the masses, at times they've been uh, taken up by opportunists, mm -hmm. which I think is a justifiable claim by government to find out really. Because the overall uh, role of a state is surely state preservation. And when something, uh, something, I don't know how to, to frame it, when something, gets to your very existence and threatens your very existence, then you must find out sure. But, but George, yes. um, you're saying, um, let me just stick on that argument that you're trying to build on, mm. that um, the, the existence of the government of Ruto yes. is being threatened yes. and they want to try as much as they can to expose the markers behind the Gen Z's. As I started the show, mm. I categorically stated that the rationale behind this was, to first of all, front an idea that will put aside the finance bill, which Baba Raila termed as it's a clamp down on investment, mm. and it's going to uh, put, see very many Kenyans uh, languishing in poverty. True, true. That said, this, fi this particular finance bill mm. was majorly uh, looking at, you know, because the IMF said you need to uh, raise a particular amount, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the young people are saying, you know what, no. We can't allow this. Mm -hmm. We need to find ways of standing on our feet. Mm -hmm. And all that shows one thing, that there is a unified, uh, there's a unified voice that the young people have. Mm -hmm. And if you even <coughs> see where the young people are getting their money from, from mm -hmm. people who even have no interest, mm -hmm. yeah, people are running campaigns to raise money to support people who are going on the streets to riot. Mm -hmm. So what kind of backers are we looking at here then? Mm -hmm. Because the only backers that we have are providing either uh, uh, support in kind or in money. Mm. So what other backers are we looking at? I, I think uh, you, you raise surely very good points. But uh, my point is that, and, and, and that's why I had, I had to first draw contrast between what I'm trying to say from what uh, my other colleagues have shared, that what we have right now in Kenya, the protests that we have mm. actually issue best. My only concern is that when such uprising come about, for example, if you can talk of countries like uh, countries like Libya, that uh, the Arab Scream came up, it came from Egypt, went to Libya and all these other Middle Eastern countries. And it reached a point where the U.S. now used that justification to come mm -hmm. and NATO forces come and, and, and oust Gaddafi. So I think, in, 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 because I was, I was trying to draw it to context, if, if we're in a home on end <coughs> and uh, I'm a dad, and I'm not giving my son food. And my son comes and uh, says, Dad, you know what? I'm tired of you not giving me food. I, 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 turn, I turn a deaf ear to that. And then tomorrow, my son comes with paraffin and burns the house. For me, for, for, mm. I think it's justifiable for both the government to first answer the issue of the food, mm. but also to question where my son got paraffin and actually got the strength to come and burn down the what? I don't know what I'm trying to... Yeah, you do. Uh, yeah. And uh, for, for, for the very part, because not every Kenyan is actually taking part in these in this protests, much as they, 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 they affect a very, very big part of the population. And like I said, the government still has a duty mm. to protect each and every citizen. When some Gen Zs go to the extent of burning cars and burning buildings, then they are, there's a justifiable claim, really, okay, that is for the state to come and rein in on some of these things, to come and find <coughs> out for the protests that started out very peaceful. Because coming and sitting down, I, I saw pictures of medical interns going to the Ministry of, of, of Health and sleeping on the balcony, spending a night there saying that if you don't pay our allowances, 
we're not going to leave this place. I don't think that in any way inconveniences anyone. But when you come down and torch a parliament, a section of the parliament building, you come down, our, our own Ugandan building was actually, I don't know where the claims, uh, I don't know how the investigations went on that, but some of these violent aspects of the riots coming to surface, I think then the government has a justifiable claim to come and find out, first of all, where such things are emanating from, and to surely right. create a harmony for everyone. Emmanuel. Yes. On that point, violence. Mm. I stated that the three stages, dialogue, peaceful demonstrations, and violent demonstrations. Mm. And what we see in Kenya, maybe from his argument, that the reason as to why now the government is coming on board is because we are seeing extremists in the cause by the Gen Zs. The, the arguments raised in Kenya that the people who in Kenya at the moment are... Um, are going ahead on, on, on the streets because they actually believe that they are trying to front their cause. That if we give you the power, we elect you in office, you need to respect the mandate we give you in terms of our vote. That means you need to deliver and give us our rights. That was the initial cause yeah. of the Gen Zs. Yeah. And I believe it is still the cause of the Gen Zs. True, true, true. Maybe the line that we need to draw is where are the other the extremists coming from? Could it be that uh, maybe certain politicians are trying to clamp down or trying to pluck their claws into this particular uh, cause, maybe to maybe gain certain uh, political uh, poise or something of, of the sort? So I'd like you to help us understand the situation, drawing for us a nexus between the initial understanding mm. of the Gen Zs to what is causing these extremists. And then would then the government be justified to go ahead and expose uh, the, the backers of the Gen Zs? because you have people entering into the House, the National Assembly, which is, which is not right. Mm. Yeah, I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Thank you. You know, I equally wanted to, to respond to, to his deliberations. Mm. He puts forward a, a valid argument, in my opinion. When you say that the government is right to take deliberate steps to try to find out why people are doing that and why their reaction to, to the bill because he seems to have at the back of his mind, to, he seems to suggest that the, the force he used mm. was not reasonable to, to what they, are pro, they were protesting against. But also if I were to ask him a question, yeah. like Melody said, that it is estimated that that bill would increase unemployment mm. rate by 12%. Yeah, yeah. We know what that variance in, in percentages does. Mm. We know it's actually a very big impact. Mm. So if I were to ask him one small question, isn't that a justifiable cause other factors will start? If I were a government, mm. would I, why would I think that the, the, the bill that has that much effect on people is not enough cause to let them demonstrate and even do strikes? Demonstrate peacefully? Yes. And if I am, I, I, I am seeming not to, to have the willingness to adjust Yes, and leave that position and do away with it. Why shouldn't these people or that same ground go ahead and now do a strike, a violent one? Maybe because because of what huge effect mm. that bill has on in, in 30, in 30 other seconds, factors constant. Other, other factors constant, because mm. you raise something still very pertinent. The, the problem that I see with these headless movements is, is that, because mm. they are continuous, when you mention that because the initial, the initial <coughs> project for the Gen Zs mm. was the finance bill, among other things. Mm. But now we have seen, actually even two weeks or three weeks into the protests, each, whenever, uh, when Ruta says, I'm not going to sign the finance bill, the Gen Z says yes. But then they say, apart from signing the finance bill, we also want this one. Kindly uh, make sure that you, dis, you, dis, you disassemble all your cabinet members. Ruto reshuffles all cabinet members. They say, since we've also won this one, Ruto also must go. So, I don't know, I don't know if I'm speaking as a politician or someone who is not caring about those issues. But then, because ultimately, and I, w I want to be as open as possible, mm. when I get power, my ultimate goal or to retain it. is to retain it and to find means to retain it. So, Kwesuga, I think even Ruto then raises a very good... Uh, observation when he says, but I've, give, I've, I've, I've been conceding all the way. You said no to the finance bill, I said let the finance bill go. You said cabinet is infested with a lot of corrupt officials, I said let cabinet go. Now you're saying let 
me, the person who has considered all that while, let me go. Don't I have a justifiable <laughs> claim to say that, let me find out really who then is a... Beca because like I said, Ruto won with a very, very slight margin. So I wouldn't be surprised that he can get all that opposition in Kenya because it's a highly divided nation. She has something to say that yes. you can get back to it. Okay, so, Guinea. You see, when we had the French Revolution, mm. it was because of the things that had happened over time. But there was that one thing that sparked off the revolution, yes? Mm. So, it is for that reason that the Kenyans now think it is the right time for us now to actually change what Kenya looks like. Mm. Because France was able to change because of, was it storming of Bastille? I don't know, maybe it was Bastille. that. Yeah. Yes. When they stormed that, then it helped them actually um, do away with the leadership of King Louis, who had suffocated them for long, do away with the Queen and all those other injustices. So I believe that it is now Kenya's chance and time now to do away with all those kinds of things that have not been good for them. Because now they have, the chance is now that they have been able to do away with the financial bill, that they think their voices are heard and still need to stand up and say, hey, we can do this, we can still do this, and we will have a better Kenya. That is why I feel like it should be continuous until when they achieve what they want to achieve. Because if they do the financial bill and then stop there, then leave the cabinet ministers, it means things will get worse again because they have just done a small, a small part and left the other big part unattended to. Maybe in, in 10 seconds then, Melody. I think the discussion then should not be about protest, mm -hmm. but a revolution or a change of government. Because uh, I am very quite sure that the Kenyan constitution prescribes how well, government can change. And it's not that, uh, be because even then, I think even the 7 million that voted Ruto still would want him in government, I, I would want to presume. But uh, because I think, Kosuga, as you come in, you would have to change the, what we are discussing today. Because if the Kenyan people, surely, the real intention was to remove Ruto, then they would have fronted that at the start. Not to hide under the <coughs> finance bill. Now, getting back to, to try to attempt to, to answer your question, Drake. You know, what we are discussing as a matter of fact is politics. Mm -hmm. True. You know what people misunderstand is that people try to run away from uh, political talks and political truth. Yet as a matter of fact, politics is life. Mm. Everything that happens from the computers before us and uh, where we are today, if you had a, a political hand saying that uh, this debate shouldn't be here anymore, yeah. trust me, the, the following day wouldn't be here. Yeah. And because that is the case, politics is amorphous. It is multifaceted. It is multidimensional. Mm. That being the case, we cannot discuss politics in its entirety. True. What we only can do within our small knowledge mm. of such a huge a, a huge scope and concept mm. is we can only bite bits. She gives a bit and she, she, she gives a bit and equal they have a bit. And we can try to, to merge that and create a, a middle ground. Mm. What am I saying? That what we are discussing now is Kenyan politics. And I'm also saying in the same context that the reasons we are giving as valid responses and causes to, to, to that entire riot might not be anywhere close to truth. That there might be politics behind that much more than we have seen. Mm. Much more than the, the, the finance bill. Something far away from what we are discussing today. Mm. Now, James Clear, in his book, Atomic Habits, he has what he refers to as the plateau of latent potential. He gives an analogy of an ice, an ice cube, and it melts at around 32 degrees. So that when you have your ice cube on, on your table, and the room temperature is about to say 20, 25, that you will go up to 31, and the ice cube has showed no signs of, of melting. It is plateau of latent potential. It is not until you strike 32 degrees that the ice cube does melt. What am I saying? That the, the demonstrations we are seeing and that we are discussing tonight might be a number of factors, which is 25 degrees, 28, a combination of very many others, which in my opinion 
might be inclusive of what I feel is betrayal by, by Ruto to us Africans and mm. his country. If we as Africans are saying that it is high time we, we believed in our own African organizations and uniting bodies, and you are standing up and getting red carpets welcomes and speaking before American parliaments, mm. where then is the direction for, for our unity? If I were Uganda and I seven doing that, why wouldn't I be angry? Mm. Why wouldn't my senses be, be blind to even the good he does? Because to me, I've already identified a traitor who shouldn't even stand chance, mm. irrespective of how willing he is to reform. Because I've seen that your spirit is one that is not for Africa, but rather to use Africa to, to, to fulfill your own agenda. What does he mean by saying that he, them as Kenyans are going to work with America? Did he in any case, was, it, was there a referendum to, to get Kenyans' opinion of how they feel about America in the first place? Definitely not. So that, uh, by the way, could be a combination of factors as to why these people are demonstrating, but it is not a genuine reason for, for them to say we are demonstrating because he's, he went to America. We are demonstrating because Kenya is now a non-NATO ally. Mm. You see? You know there is what is called a fissure in geography. A fissure is a point of eruption, for example. Like you made reference to the Arab Spring, you know the Arab Spring started by the self-immolation of Muhammad Bouaziz. Mm. Yes? So everything has a starting point. So I think it could have been a boil up of emotions, but waiting for that genuine point mm. that can create enough basis and locus for people to say, we are standing up for this. But yet there is a combination of a number of other factors in, in the background, mm. which I think is actually true. Other feeling. If these people had not had a preconceived stance about Ruto, Ruto's change of, of, of character and what he's moving into, probably this finance bill would not have yeah. been this mess. Mm -hmm. There are other factors. And as time goes by, it can't be today or tomorrow, but we'll discover that the reasons, the, 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 the finance bill was just a fissure. Mm. It was a melting point, but there were other things in, in between. Involved. Yes. Definitely. Melody. Been quiet, and I'd just like to indulge you again. Um, the question in Kenya <coughs> is one that uh, possibly <coughs> something early on hinted. George said the problem with what we face with movements that are headless, oftentimes it loses its meaning. So is it high time, just like we had people power before it became the national unity platform, it was still a movement, and people are arguing that it will lose its credibility. Then Chagulani went ahead and formed a, a political party. He argues that everything we are discussing is politics. Is it then proper for the Gen Z's of Kenya, maybe to sideline the fears of the government, to go ahead and create a political party? Okay. Thank you very much. So, the young people in Kenya, like I said earlier, have have started the demonstration because of the financial bill but like emma said there are other reasons that could have brought the demonstration and the protests at the end of the day yeah, yeah? just like i said in the french revolution there were very many problems that were existing but because they had a chance to storm so <coughs> they were able to actually present the other problems yeah. um a political party i don't believe would be a solution yeah but if because at the end of the day we realize if a political party is formed they will have a leader just like Chagulani mm. and then that is the leader that government will now start targeting and therefore mm. their efforts are going to be put to to waste at the end of the day mm. Chagulani will be taken maybe exiled or something mm. and therefore they will have no direction in which they can be put to the front so I believe the way they are um, most people will say it is a disorganized movement but we realize it has caused impact at the end of the day yeah. the financial bill was not affected um, they have dismissed the cabinet and yeah and therefore I think for those reasons they can be the way they are mm. and then they can create an impact on the society and have the change that they want I'm um, out to respond to something that Guinera was talking about. What was it? He was talking about that government is justifiable for what they are doing and that the protests on the streets that have turned into violence are actually 
why government now should come in and mm. protect the people. But hey, these people have come and started in a peaceful way. And they offer expect change at the end of the day. Yeah? Mm. When they come and say we do not want the financial bill, they have started this week and they are okay. So at that point, we expect parliament now to come and sit and say, the young people do not want this. What can we do? And we would really expect change in the shortest time because this is something that can escalate and bring something um, worse. Yeah. So what I think now, the, the extremism and the, the car burning and everything, now comes because action has not been taken at the time when it should be taken. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that is why I think the young people now are justify the reason why they should really continue and demand for things that they really want at the end of the day. But yeah. I'm sure what point, if um, you keep on demanding and you do not have an organized front, want at a particular point the essence of the movement sway away from its objective? I'm likely not. An example in Uganda, NOOP. NOOP had an impact on government people power it was called people power from the start. Mm. They really like had an impact on government when they had just come. But what direction has it taken right now is what we now look at. After getting a leader, the leader has been captured and there are allegations that allegations that he works for government. Yeah. So that is the where the problem work comes from. All right, shall let's go for a break. I'm going to give you a historical context. Maybe I'll have George come. You know, the historical context even for the fight of independence in various African countries. Mm. It started from movements. Yeah. And the movements that pushed for independence later on became political parties. You look, come, look into Kenya. It started with movements. Look into South Africa, movements. Look into uh, Algeria, movements. Look into Egypt before NASA came in, movements. So all that is something maybe we shall look into. Can, can I answer before <laughs> we go for the break? Yeah, sure. You, um, right. That comes with time. Yeah. It is not the right time for the journalists mm -hmm. to have a movement, to, to have a leader. It okay. is not the right time. All right. Let's but just, it will come. Let's just quickly go for a short break. Uh, we'll see you in a bit. Stay with us. See you shortly. Digital rights are those human rights and legal rights that allow individuals to access, use, create and publish digital media or to access and use computers, other electronic devices and telecommunication networks. Digital rights include a right to freedom of expression, information and communication through technology, a right to privacy and data protection, a right to credit for personal works, a right to universal and equal digital access, a right to identity, a right to anonymity, a right to be forgotten, and a right for protection of minors among others. The state's digital rights are frequently violated through various unfair actions, for example, blockage of websites and social networks, theft of credentials, unauthorized use of people's data for personal gain, privacy intrusion, online censorship, arrests and intimidation of online users, internet blockages, and a proliferation of laws and regulations that undermine the potential of technology to drive social, economic, and political development worldwide. It is hence every citizen's responsibility to respect rights of other digital users and to speak speak out or report to the responsible parties when one's rights are violated. Welcome back from that break. Just before we went into the break, Melody was making a very important argument and I posed very important questions. Um, I, do you think it's the right time for Kenyan, uh, for the Kenyan Gen Z's possibly to form a political party? I'm not, I will just push the question over to, to, to George, but I'll get back to you. Maybe you can listen to maybe other perspectives and uh, help guide the debate <laughs> as well. But her argument is crucial. She gives us a juxtaposition with the Ugandan context and says people power before it became noob was a powerful front than it is today. So Guinea, mm. historically, <coughs> movements have informed governments. And later on, those movements became organized and formed political parties. Yeah. I gave you examples. You have you saw what happened in uh, in in what's the current Zimbabwe when they had ZANU, mm. uh, they, mm -hmm. they had ZANU, they had ZAPU. You go into um, you go into South Africa before they got independence in the 1920s. That formed the the, the ANC. Mm -hmm. You look in you go to uh, you even come to Uganda here in its own self. 
you have movements um, that helped form political parties mm -hmm. that influenced politics. And what we're discussing is politics. Mm -hmm. I'll still ask you the same fundamental question. Mm -hmm. Is it the right time for the Gen Z's in Kenya to come up and form a political party? Because yes, they are the majority in Kenya mm -hmm. and they would like to see a change. Because we know Gen Z's are one, politically conscious, but two, aware of their society. Mm -hmm. What is your say? Yeah, I, I think that is also something that is very pertinent because ultimately it goes without saying that uh, there, there will be this need for them to have an organized front, yeah. an, an address, and, uh, and where people can actually reach out. Because what you have now, even, even when they had the let's engage with, uh, with, with the president, uh, you, you cannot pinpoint and say that this is now the person that I have to talk to. Mm. But, but still, uh, I also concede to, to Melody's fears that at times when, when, such, uh, when such movements get leaders, it's uh, sorry, when such movements get leaders, some of these things are uh, the, the, the people <coughs> themselves, like us, because we're all informed, informed and informed by the same emotions. Uh, and, it, and actually, they, at, at times, they can easily be corrupted uh, to, to, to what Melody was trying to allude to. Because, and, and, and the problem at times with the, with the leaders in these movements is that the, past, the individuals themselves at times carry, uh, the, uh, carry the, the head for them to actually the actual cause because there are very many people that believed in, 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 in people power but because now it has metamorphosed into a political party, national unity platform, yeah. there are very many people who will not talk about corruption because NUP has talked about corruption but they were highly comfortable when people power said corruption is there but now they are not comfortable because the leader is struggling and there are very many people who may share the opinion that he cannot be the one who is supposed to lead them. So they go away from the initial cause and now attach the whole cause to an individual. Mm. But like you mentioned, sure, very many of these movements, actually very many of the political parties that we have today came out of movements. And that is a fact that has been written all over Let me just briefly, quickly interject. Mm. Something has come into my mind. Mm. You see how in Uganda we lack something that unites us together. Mm. A cause that would really us behind one thing, one vision. Mm. Mm. Even historically, we lack that sense, mm. that, that one thing that would bring Ugandans together to fight for something. Mm. Now, it's that point in Kenya. Kenya has had things that has brought them together. Mm. Hmm? Just like, if, uh, let me just give context to this. You see what happened in, in, in Sudan? Mm. The price of bread right. rallied everyone behind. Mm. In Uganda, people, some people talk about corruption, some people are afraid, and there is no consorted voice. Mm. In Kenya, every young person is behind that one voice. Mm. That one Ruto must go, most young people anyway. Mm. That too, we need leaders who are, who are, who are ideologically formed mm. and who deliver, who have what they term as integrity. Mm. Now, every young person in Kenya is rallying behind that word, that voice. That even if you saw the, the video, the other MP was speaking in Parliament, said, my niece refused to take a, 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 uh, to, to ride with me in my car because I'm a member of Parliament and I was arguing that I cannot ride with you. Mm. Now, that just shows you that there is a voice behind them. Mm. Now, don't you think because that there is that one voice? Mm. You earlier on argued that Ruto won elections with very minimal what mm. margins. Remember, he rode with the hustler what okay. narrative. Mm. Now, that hustler narrative seems to have lost that cause well, because it's, it's what put him into power. Sure, sure. If the margins are so small, don't you think if the Gen Zs rallied and came up with a political party, mm. they would form something formidable? that could change the democracy of, of Kenya. Kenya. Mm, true. Uh, you raise very good points. Uh, I think to, 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 to start, let me first go back to what I was saying, that uh, many of these political parties that you have, modern day political parties, all rose out of uh, these movements that you see. Mm -hmm. That you can even see the climate change movement, actually, because you would have the Green Party in the Netherlands, even in Germany. Mm -hmm. Some of these things become political parties. Even Keir Starmer, the, 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 the new prime minister of, 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 of England, the party that, that, uh, that he represents, the Labour Party, was a trade union. And these are movements that have sprung out of, of history. But now it's a political party that represents, majorly represents the, the, the rights and, uh, and these obligations that uh, the workers have. And I think it's a genuine claim. 
when, when you mention about Uganda, the difference between Uganda and Kenya, I would want to draw context from uh, a certain text that I, wrote, I, read, I, I read sorry, from uh, Franz Fanon's book. And it says that for, for, for there to be a revolution, they are both objective and subjective causes. Objective causes being the things that we can see, that there's corruption, there are bad roads, uh, there are no medicines in the health centers, and there are very many other things. But the subjective causes being the deliberate nature of the people fronting the revolution to make sure that the people understand how all these things affect them. And I think we have not yet reached there in Uganda, that you have all these things. People are sleeping hungry, people are dying of hunger in Karamoja. People are being, uh, the, you've seen the high-handedness of the police force of all these state authorities. But people have not yet reached yet that level where the cup of endurance runs out because I also believe that the subjective causes to make sure that a one person in, in Naguru in Nigeria also believes that the same thing that affects a person in Karamoja equally affects them. But we have had in history before where people rallied in a cause in Uganda. I think it, it, when we say it's not there, it would be an, an understatement to the NRA war from, 85, from 80 to 85, because then actually people came about and said, enough is enough. We have had all this happening for a while, and we have come to say this. Uh, now, that movement that from 80 to 85 will now have out of it born the NRM. And I think, like Melody, I think to sum it up, that the Gen Zs have not yet acquired that level of discipline and uh, deliberateness to make sure that once they form a political party, they will be able to stick to it and stick to its aim to, 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 to its fulfillment. Because I think if they form it now, yeah. it can be very, very susceptible to, to, to leakages, or even it will break up before some of these gains can mature. Uh, Fanon also says in, in that very book, I, I think I'll share it after because I forget the title, hmm. that for a, for a revolution to sustain itself, it needs the most disciplined and deliberate cadres to make sure that the initial goal that it was formed, or that, it, that, that was championed by the, by the people who are bring, up, bring it about, uh, can be fulfilled to its end. And Fanon says that, uh, and this is what Museven quotes in his dissertation at the University of Dar es Salaam. It's a very good read. I think I'll share it with colleagues here. That some of these things to be sustained need the most disciplined, that they must reach that level and believe that it's no longer about me, an individual, but it's about the greater good of society. Yeah. And I don't think, as of yet, even the Gen Zs themselves have seen that person that can actually do that. That tomorrow, uh, you, you've seen why, uh, gen, the, why Gen Zs have said even they don't want Raila to be part of their arrangement, of their protests, because well, they've seen oftentimes Raila has been uh, or privy to or handshakes with the president's uh, dialogues and whatnot, and they don't want any part of that. So till they get that person who they think in themselves can be able to <coughs> the struggle without uh, being swayed away by the powers that be, I think then it will be justified for them to form a political. All right. Emmanuel, what's your opinion on the same? My opinion is just uh, one and brief. There is something I want each one of you to learn in case you don't, you don't know about it. It is the PIN psychology. P-I-N. Position, interest, and need. Everything that we ask for, everything that people demand for, mm is informed by that psychology, the pain. What's the position in this case? The position now, going by the, the present stance, is they want Ruto out. Now, if we go by, because now it's no longer about the finance bill, it's about the person of the president, that, that being Ruto. That's their position now. What's their interest? They want a new leadership, a better leadership for that matter. If you ask them why they want him out, it's because they want a better leadership. What is the need? The need goes back to even to an individual. Because what is pressing them to push him is the claims of his oppressive and, uh, and milking mechanisms of, of draining them of tax and making them poor. So now, 
that does not stop at them as a group or as, a, as Gen Z. It goes back to you as an individual. That you as an individual, you are finding it hard to survive. Same applies to them. And so we, are, we all have a similar need. But the need starting right off from, from the, the, the individual to the, entire, to the entire group. Yeah. So it's quite important that we, we assess that psychology, their position, their interest, and need. Because failure of which you can't even address their need. Yeah. Because if their position is that they want to root out, and they mean that, you know it is even possible that it, that outweighs the other two, that it outweighs the, 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 the interest and especially the, the need. It might not now be about to, it might not be about to, them wanting to, to earn more or to sustain their, their existence, but wanting to see that figure out of. So if that is the case, it's quite hard. Now, getting back to, to your question, I think for me, there is never time to have a leadership of just anything. It is something dictated by the circumstances at the end. And like we've been uh, debating with her, behind the skins, I told her that anything to survive must have a leadership. That in the short run, for now, they've been able to do it without a leadership. We, well, we are not sure that they do not have any other mm. forces behind. Mm. But if that is the case, and these people, for example, Ruto is still in office and they are persistent and they want him out of office, they can't do that for an entire, t entire year without a leadership structure. Now, my answer is one. It is important that if, you know, these people are quite many and their voices can be heard because they've shaken the entire, the entire region. Mm -hmm. That means that they are strong enough and they can do anything. The best way they can do a thing, if you ever want to have anything well done, do it for yourself. So if they feel the current leadership does not satisfy them, let them do it for themselves. How do they have to do it? Let them have their own leadership. Let them front a candidate for anything. Or let them get uh, let them entrench into those systems and take up those leadership positions from the grassroots. So a leadership structure, if they have a sustainable thing and one that will, will cause impact, definitely. That is the to me there is no question about that. Mm -hmm. They very much need to, to have that mm -hmm. as fast as they can. But maybe if their goal is simply to have root out of office or to have the finance be completely erased, if they achieve that, and if that's their own intention, they have no reason for having a leadership because their, their goal is, is, is a short-term short -term one. But if it is long-term, definitely they, they need a leadership. The question of how best they will be able to choose a leadership that will not betray their cause is a question for a discussion for another day, but we really need a leadership structure. All right. Mm. As we come towards the end of our conversation, I'd just like to engage Melody on the discussion now. That is, what the government is trying to do to expose these uh, potential backers for the Gen Zs. As we reach towards the end, do you think, will this add any positive value or negative value? Okay. So, that's <coughs> Definitely deciding to expose the leaders of the young people is what they think is best for them. Yeah. yeah? And they think is what um, is good for the government now to thrive and exist after everything. But there is just that they will not find who is actually backing them up mm -hmm. at the end of the day. So I believe there is need for them now to say, since we do not have the direct person to attack or the direct person now to talk to, it is now the right time to actually do what is right. Because it's not like do what the young people want, no. Mm. It is to do what is actually right at the end of the day. Mm. Do away with all these bad things they have been doing and then have a good government that people want to see at the end of the day. I believe the, the things like Luto must go it's not just like something that they just come up with. I believe if Luto was a good president, that the president that they thought was going to be when they voted him, they would not want him to leave office, yeah? But for reasons that he has not been good to them is why they think he should go. But if he made reforms, then people would actually say, we can have him, yeah? 
but when going back to your question exposing um exposing the people that are backing up the gen z it's not something that is important at the end of the day mm. the important thing at the end of the day is make reforms in the kind of system that they have established and have a better government that people want to see at the end of the day right interesting yeah. so what lessons do you think maybe ugandan youth can also draw from what is happening in kenya but then lastly what can our government learn from the situation in kenya okay so now that would really be another discussion for another day but yeah simply what the young people can learn um i see much to parliament yeah we have seen that maybe it's so, against the party <laughs> yes much to parliament on 23rd mm. put on black and much to parliament mm. how i wish all the young people in uganda would really march to parliament on that day but the problem is that uganda is not as kenya is That's um, my argument. We don't have that yes. one thing that brings us together. No, we we already have what, what brings us we together. Have, yeah. We have it. Nice. But the problem is that we cannot stand and say Execution now, of that plan. When I was talking to these guys, I I was asking Nyera will you march to parliament and he's like yes and I told him I am scared of tear gas. Mm. So that is where the problem is. Yeah? So what lessons in, because we saw yes. we saw what the Kenyan yes. youth in Kenya someone is smoking. Yeah. In <laughs> Kenya it was different mm. the police was actually helping these guys with water to wash their eyes after they had put tear mm. gas so what we can learn is that we need to understand that <coughs> there are problems that are affecting us already mm. yeah but we need to have now a common stand i don't think we need a leader much to parliament right now has a, doesn't have an open leader mm. but people are doing work and make sure this thing is effective yeah so what we need to do is now to all understand that we are young people and have reasons to fight for this because it will affect us in the near future anyways then what government can learn um though it is very hard for the ugandan government to learn anyways but what government can learn is that we need to make reforms mm. because Uganda has way bigger problems than Kenya if Kenya's problems are 60% Uganda's is 90 so is like make a change and have government look better and provide for the needs of the people at the end of the day right. george yes. i'm also going to ask for your opinion on what lessons can Ugandan youth draw from the going on in Kenya but also what lessons can our government learn Sure. I, I think maybe as a disclaimer, uh, over over the course of the show, I've uh, I've, I've tried to 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 justify some of Ruto's uh, things, but I was a very very strong supporter of the Hasna movement. Yeah. Uh, I even had colleagues who bought air tickets to go for the swearing in, <laughs> though I wasn't able to go. But even then, <coughs> I think like like some Kenyans or many Kenyans, we believe that the the, the Hasna movement. what the UD is stood for was something for the people and we are reminiscing with my colleagues and over the course of the three years that Ruto has been in leadership surely the Kenyans have not had the best part of mm. what they thought was yeah. going to come out of the Ruto mm. leadership which which i think surely called for Ruto's introspection to touch through and see for a person that had all these numbers and even young people surely those you know it spoke to the young people all the hustlers of the economy and that I'm going to put a hustler fund I'm going to do this and this for the young people and now these are the same people that are saying that no they uh, no been making empty promises you have you've been making empty promises and some of these things must what must change and i think over the course of the show I've gotten to understand that actually the real backers of of the gen z movement is the finance field mm. uh, that is the real engine of the what of the of the whole protest so they should look at themselves they should look at themselves rather than going back to the gen z and telling you no there's mm -hmm. someone supporting you because like i said it's it's an issue based protest there's a clear uh, there's a clear underlying issue as to why these people are protesting it didn't just come out of the blue and to 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 mention maybe something small about what you mentioned <laughs> uh, in uganda why we have never had such such an issue yeah studying these things i i don't think even because for all these countries corruption has been happening in kenya for quite some time our politicians they are very uh, people have private jets and helicopters and what not it has been happening for some time then maybe the question would be that over the course of time wasn't why hasn't it been the issue people have sprung up why has it been the finance bill 
So I think, like I've told colleagues, that at one point, like you mentioned, in South Sudan, for everything Bashir had done, he had killed people in the, in the thousands. <coughs> Surely in the thousands, displaced, displaced many <coughs> feminine and whatnot. But it was only the increase of what? Of bird prices that mobilized people. And Bashir was overthrown. And the downside of, of, of such headless movements, like we have, the people in Sudan fought very much for what they wanted, even in Egypt. But what you have in place, actually, military governments. Because these people, after fighting for what they deemed fit to fight for, they didn't have a leadership that was going to spear, spearhead post the revolution. So you have now opportunists taking advantage of the vacuum. El is in power. You have a military junta that is, you have a fight in Sudan between uh, top military generals, the RP, the, is it RSF, the Rapid Support Forces, and the military generals. You have in Libya the like four governments. Any person who can get 100 uh, people to hold guns can say, today in Mitiana, this is the government that we have. So I think that is also a downside of the headless movements that post the revolution, after it succeeded, what next? What we can learn? There are very many lessons written all over from what we can pick from there. And Kenyan democracy is, is surely one of those to benchmark from. Yeah. Because for our president to, 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 to go down and actually even hold the Twitter space, I think that's a statement on end to the president that I supported, His Excellency. I think that's a statement. Reshuffling cabinet, mm. a very big statement. So these are all things that you can learn. That when people reach that breaking point and say that, uh, President Ruto, kind of look into this. This is a very pertinent issue. I think we must accord them that respect. What we can learn as young people from the, from the Kenyans is that, first of all, we are very proud of the Kenyans, mm. of the Kenyan people, the young people, that you mobilized the whole movement that has made news globally on TikTok, on basic, basic things. It wasn't guns, it wasn't, but it was on buying data and sitting down and say, this issue is, and this is how it is going to affect us. And I think on end, like I mentioned before, the problem that we have is that we have all these issues, but we're failing to, to find persons that are willing to help us, yeah. to show us how this, because I may know, but the person in, Car in, in Bukedia, who knows that the speaker, our person is the speaker, may not know that the 500 million that she's using to buy a generator at home can actually be used to set up a health facility in Bukedia. Some of those things. So I think in a wrap up, surely, like Franz Fanon mentioned that each, each generation must find its objective out of relative obscurity and either fulfill it or betray it. Once you get that, and if the people on the panel are willing, we mobilize around that issue and also put on a forbidden of fight, maybe and maybe mm -hmm. some of these things will change. Perfect. Yes. Emmanuel, lessons uh, Ugandan youth can draw from the Kenyan Gen Zs, but also government as well. What lessons can they learn? The word opportunity cost for those of, of, of you, all of us that did uh, economics. But also commerce. Refers to, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> refers to the next best alternative for a goal when choice is made. And so as, as youth or as Ugandan citizens, mm. what we need is quite a range of, of items. All the reforms we might need to see. But also for us to be able to learn a lesson, for example, and implement it, we need one to have gone back to the drawing board and knowing what we need to what we need last in that chronology. Yes? Some things, there are, there are two words that seem related but have, yes, they, they are almost intertwined, but the small difference is a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Peace and justice. Now, what is a challenge for us and what we are lacking as a generation? And what should be the biggest topic or lesson from the Gen Z demonstration mm. is that we, if we are to hunt for, for justice, there is a price to pay and we should be ready to, to pay it. Failure of which justice shall largely be an illusion. And a sound that rowers in the distant land are not anything close to, to our proximity. How we clear on that? Definitely. But if we choose to opt for peace, ah, I know Ugandan police, ah, let me opt for safety. 
safety and peace are now one and the same. So, if that's the, the, the direction you take on your opportunity cost, if you prioritize peace over the, the general public good, mm. over the general hunt for, for justice and for a better society, you cannot achieve anything. I am not inciting violence. But also, if I am, maybe I am, which might be okay now. I am not. For <laughs> <laughs> matters of peace. <laughs> uh, upon the comprehension and analysis of <laughs> introspection. <laughs> yes, I think I am not. I am only making a, a genuine. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> sure. So, yeah. I think we need collective voices, not only at national level, mm. but we need to understand that if as students of UCU or as students of Makerere, we need to have such a policy mm. put in place or done away with, then we cannot achieve that by, by mere speech, but by standing up in unison. That, of course, goes back to, to, to even the larger scale. Yeah. So. The take home and the biggest for me and for what I think should be a topic for us, the youth, is that we cannot simply claim and, and assume to only today because we are the young generation. That alone is not enough. And it's not enough parameter upon which our, 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 our input in society is, is measured. But how deliberate are we to executing it? So that is the biggest lesson. One, we need to know that as Ugandan youth, if we are to, to do what those people did, mm the resistance we are likely to face is much higher, is much, higher much higher, more than 100 percent mm -hmm. that. So it is up to, to you as an individual to, to know that you need to pay this price or to opt for, for peace and, and comfort and let everything proceed the way it is and the best you can, we can do is make noise. To our government is that you know in, in betraying the city by Francis Ibuga, the, the, the discussion between Jerry and Mosese. Mm -hmm. I think it is Mosese who, who says that he, even when the liquids have a boiling point, human points have a breaking point. Yes? So the government should learn from our neighbors that when people are squeezed, they lose, at one point they lose the elastic limit and they break. And the person who has broken in this context has no feeling for life and they don't fear anything and they can do anything. So I think governments, not just our government, but governments should never pull people to elastic limit and, and have them break because uh, 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 anything beyond that stage is really uh, so bad for, for, for whichever country that is victim of the same. Okay. Your concluding remarks? My concluding remarks. Uh, James Clear in Atomic Habits as what he refers to as the aggregation of marginal gains. Way back in, I think, around 19, 1970s, we had this Tour de France companies, it's a, a bicycle in competition, and the, the British team was doing really so badly. Yeah. It was doing so badly in that area. So they had the Dave Braceford, this gentleman at, at Manu now, and when he came on board, what he implemented was aggregation of, of marginal gains. He came with that concept believing that he, just something small done has a higher impact, not in the short run, but in the long run. So he, he implemented that. He started yeah. by finding the best mattresses for the, bi, for, for the bicycle people to, to sleep on, the right kind of girl to, to smear, and just everything, very basic things that seem to have no impact from the onset, but in the long run have a very uh, key, key, key and fundamental input and contribution to whichever cause we choose to, to run for. Still, to, to add on that, he goes ahead to say that when you are going to Los Angeles, you are leaving Los Angeles to, to, to New York. Uh, uh, New York and Los Angeles, it is a distance of about 225 miles, like 225 miles apart. That when you shift the heading, by 3.5 feet south, you are from Los Angeles to, to New York. You end up in Washington. And he says that 3.5 feet is something you might not notice when you are setting off. But in the long run, you are going to, to New York, you land in Washington. A city very distant and far apart. 
this point from these two examples and analogies is that we cannot think that we will wake up and do huge things and overturn just everything. But his emphasis is we can start small. Yeah. Is that if we cannot achieve much as a group or if we don't have a, a, a united effort, but as an individual you can be intentional about doing a thing, about doing X and H, can be intentional about, about doing Y and I, Z. And before we know it, our small contributions to, to whatever it is that we are doing in the long run pays really so much. So it is a, a, a call, a wake up call voice to, to, to youth and to, to, to Ugandans that we need to indeed be deliberate and fight for what we believe in. We must break social conformity. What is killing us today's conformity is you do not want to speak because you fear uh, Guinea's reaction because I do not want my 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 friend uh, Melody to, to think I am disagreeing with their opinion because you do not have you do not want to to have a rift with your family mm -hmm. and uh, that conformism is really killing us so much. Okay. You can relate that to admit and what popular and tyranny of masses these terms I keep referring to. So we need to be intentional and stand up for what we believe in. That said, thank you so much for, for hosting us. The crew team, thank you so much for the work and our dear viewers, it's been nice uh, speaking to you. Are you listening to us? All right, um, George, concluding remarks in 60 seconds. Yes. Uh, I think I'll not differ very much from what the question has mentioned, but only to give thanks to, to the team and everyone who has been able to, to make sure that we have this dialogue. And I think uh, from the Kenyan, as, as Ugandans, there's a lot to learn from, the good and bad, surely. Because uh, I think the, the good is, is that people can actually raise up yeah. and champion change in their smallest of ways. Because mm -hmm. none of the Gen Zs is a minister, none of the <coughs> very, very normal people who have rise up and even make sure that cabinet can change once they say it can change. The bad things are that, the bad, or actually good things that you can learn from them is that people can reach to a level and start burning down cars to prove a point, mm -hmm. and start breaking buildings to prove a point, and start looting to prove a point. So before we reach that extent, because we can, we can, we can actually mitigate factors that can make us reach that, that, that extent. So let us be deliberate about what we're doing now, because it very much informs our future. Uh, to the government, because it's the overall head and the decision makers. We pray that, because they're the biggest learners from what has happened in Kenya. Like someone mentioned here, whatever happens that side, like the Arab Spring, started here and it sprung all over, uh, over 20 countries in the mm. Middle East and Northern Africa. So these things are not peculiar to us. They're not exclusive to Kenyans, sorry. They can actually happen here. So thank you very much. And to our dear viewers, Asante, uh, we shall meet on the next show if there's any. Definitely they will. Melody. Okay, just like you said, 60 seconds, I'll not take more. Um, so I'll, I'll conclude by saying that um, as young people, what we need to know is that we have all the interest. We are very intelligent people. If we can come here and discuss about <coughs> that affect other people and be able to analyze them, um, it means it is the right time for us to act. Yeah, We have had youth members of parliament, we have had whatever, but we do not see a change in the dialogues and in the peaceful kinds of, of revolutions that we have put up. So what we can do as the young people is now use the intellect that we have and be able to start up something that we think can effect change at the end of the day. Could be a revolution, could be a protest, but something that we think is good for our community and for the entire society. Government, I do not have what to tell government because they definitely know what they're supposed to do and what is right, but rather do not want to do it at the end of the day. Yeah. So my conclusion is that it is now upon us to use all the minds and the knowledge that we have to make sure that we have the best community that we want. Um, so I'll... I'll thank the panelists I had and the moderator and to the viewers, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it's been a very interesting conversation. I've been joined by Guinea George, Melody, and then Kwesi Kwa Emmanuel for this very interesting segment of the Inter-University Debates. See you next week, same time, same place. Bye-bye uh, for now, but I'd like also to say thank you to Civic Space TV, thank you to Center for Constitutional Governance, and to the production crew. Asante sana, see you next week. <laughs>